Hello, and welcome. I am Exit Light, and this is my channel. Today we're going to talk about the Bennington Triangle and the persons who have gone completely missing, vanished without a trace from the area. Before we get started, if you would please give this video a thumbs up. It really helps my channel. If you are not subscribed and you would like to be, please go ahead and do that. And if you would like to be notified of my content when it goes live, please go ahead and click that bell. But notice that when you click that bell, there's a new feature and somewhere on your screen will pop up the options of being notified every time I upload content, occasionally when I upload content, or rarely when I upload content. Please keep clicking until you get the option you would like. Now, let's settle in and talk about this interesting place. To the people who live in the Bennington Triangle area or surrounding it in southwestern Vermont, for those who have lived there for many years, it might strike fear in their heart. For those who are their children or grandchildren who have heard the stories of the five years where people vanished without a trace while simply walking on a trail. It could also strike fear in their hearts, stir the imagination, make people wonder exactly what happened in the years between 1945 and 1950. And if whatever happened could ever happen again. So let's get started and I'll introduce you to the people who went missing here. The very first person known to have gone missing was a man named Mitty Rivers. His disappearance occurred on November 12th, 1945, and he was not your average 74-year-old man. Mitty was not one for sitting on a porch and drinking an iced tea. He was an avid outdoorsman. He loved to hunt, and in fact, the day he went missing, he was guiding a group of hunters through the Bennington area. He was taking them up around a place called Hell Hollow in the southwest woods of Glastonbury. On their way back home, Mitty, not one to be slow, got ahead of the hunters and was never seen again. The only evidence found of Mitty was a single rifle cartridge that was found in a stream. It's suspected that he probably bent over and the cartridge fell out of his pocket. Why he didn't pick it up, we don't know. Why he was never seen again, we don't know. 300 concerned local citizens and U.S. Army soldiers were dispatched from Massachusetts Fort Devens and they combed through this area for eight days. And other than the cartridge, there wasn't a single thing there to suggest that Mitty had ever been in the area. He vanished, never to be seen again. Mitty disappeared in the Long Trail Road area. The next 
a year later, on December 1st, 1946, was an 18-year-old girl, college student, in fact. She was studying at Bennington College. She disappeared on December 1st. Her name was Paula Jean Weldon. Paula Jean worked at the school in the commissary. And that day, she left her job. She went to her apartment on campus, and she changed her clothes out of her uniform. She put on some clothes to take a walk along the long trail. Paula hitchhiked for part of the way, and she walked for part of the way until she got to the end of the long trail. On the trail, she was seen several times by different people. She was seen by an elderly couple. She was seen by a group of climbers. She stopped them, asked them some questions about the trail. And she was seen by a man who worked for the local newspaper. This trail has different arms that veer off. Many of them were blocked by large boulders because they were no longer in use. She was seen walking along the trail. The elderly couple, in fact, was following her. They watched as Paula got to a corner on the trail and took it. They continued walking. They were about a hundred yards behind her at the time, and when they got there, they didn't see her anywhere. In fact, no one ever saw her again. Paula's disappearance made history. Not only was it one of the most infamous missing person cases in Vermont, but her missing person case led to the creation of the Vermont State Police Department. Her not returning that afternoon didn't alarm her roommate enough to tell anybody that she hadn't come home. So her roommate went to bed. When she got up the next morning and Paula was still not there, she notified the school and a massive search for Paula began. At least 1,000 people began to search for Paula along the long trail. Numerous aircraft was utilized and a variety of assisting law enforcement departments looked for her. She had been wearing a bright red coat. Should have been very easy to find. But there was nothing. There was no clues whatsoever. Paula gave no clue that she intended to be gone for any longer than it took to walk the trail. She left in her apartment everything that belonged to her warmer clothing, her luggage, her ID, and her money. There's nothing to suggest that Paula ran away, especially considering that she walked a trail. She didn't get in a car and drive off and disappear. She just went for a walk, like many people do. But, unlike many other people, Paula never returned home. The search for her was greatly criticized. Her father criticized the way the Sheriff's Department handled it. And that is what eventually did lead to the State Police Department being formed. They were trained to handle missing person cases after that. Then, exactly three years later, to the very day, the Bennington Triangle saw 
one of its more supernatural disappearances. On that day, a 68-year-old man whose name was James Tedford, he boarded a bus to Bennington. He had been visiting relatives in St. Albans, Vermont. Numerous eyewitnesses, including the driver, confirmed that Ted had been in his seat on that bus right up until the stop right before Bennington, and he had never gotten off. Yet, when the bus pulled into Bennington, Ted was gone. He had completely disappeared, vanished into thin air. Nobody understood it. They couldn't figure out how it was possible for a man to disappear on a moving vehicle. And in Ted's seat remained his luggage and an open bus timetable. But no Ted, who was never seen again. Then, nearly a year later, in mid-October in 1950, eight-year-old Paul Jepson went missing. He was last seen playing in his yard by his father's pickup truck. He had been with his mother, and his mother went to go tend to the pigs and check on the dump that she and her husband were the caretakers of. His mother was gone for an hour. When she came back, Paul Jepson, eight-year-old boy, was gone. He was missing without a trace. There were hundreds of people brought in for a search party. A New Hampshire sheriff brought in a bloodhound to sniff out the missing boy. The dog was able to hit immediately on the young boy's scent, but abruptly lost it at the trail at a nearby crossroads. Where had the boy gone? He also somehow managed to be on the long trail when he vanished into thin air. And if that's not strange enough, rumors started creeping up that perhaps his mother had fed him to the pigs. Although most people thought that that was quite unlikely. But in keeping with the eerie feeling that now surrounded the Bennington Triangle. The boy's father told the Albany Times Union that for weeks leading up to his disappearance, his son talked incessantly about disappearing in the woods. He called it the lure of the mountains. His father said maybe he was pulled into the lure of the mountains. What a strange idea. What a strange feeling one gets when hearing that. That a father could dismiss his child's disappearance as being lured into the mountains because an eight-year-old boy for some time before his disappearance spoke about the lure of the mountains. Then, finally, about two weeks later, 53-year-old Frida Langer, who was 
an avid outdoors woman, a very experienced hiker. She was a survivalist who was quite at ease in the area, quite familiar with her surroundings. She went missing on the Somerset area of the Long Trail, bordering East Glastonbury. After hiking for just a half of a mile, which was nothing for her, having hiked, climbed, hunted for her whole life, it was nothing. But she fell into a stream and she got wet and she didn't want to continue on in the wet clothes. So she asked her cousin, who was walking with her, Herbert Eisner, to keep go ahead and keep going. She said she would get on back to camp and change her clothes real quick. And while she was there, she was going to check on her husband. He was there resting with a hurt knee. But her husband never saw her. She never made it back to camp. Helicopters from the Connecticut Coast Guard and the U.S. Army in Massachusetts, as well as local aircraft from citizens and the Vermont Aeronautics Commission helped to search for Langer. As many as up to 400 people, including the Massachusetts National Guard, meticulously went inch by inch searching the area where she would have disappeared. And they found nothing. There was nothing to suggest that she had been there. We've talked about this before on these missing people cases that the FBI says that the average person will leave up to 2,000 clues per mile that they've been there. Whether that's broken pine needles, broken twigs, crushed leaves, whether they sat down in the dirt to rest, whether they stopped to tie their shoes, whether they tripped, up to 2,000 clues. And yet, there was nothing here to suggest that anything violent had happened. Nothing, not a scuffle in the dirt. This an area that she was so familiar with. She hadn't fallen down. There was no blood. Nothing. But one thing separates this case from all the others. Six months later, after she had gone missing, her corpse was found near the Somerset Reservoir. Now, this area was a completely open area, quite visible, easy to access, and had been searched extensively, extensively, linking arms, walking, poking sticks, dozens of times in the previous months. And she was not there. Her body was not there. But now, here it was. And her body had decayed so badly that no cause of death could be determined. But it was whole. She wasn't eaten by an animal. She didn't get lost and wander off into this reservoir, into this open patch of land, and then not be seen by the people who were searching. So what happened to her? What happened to Frida? Of course, the likelihood that we will ever know is not good. But what happened during those five years along that trail? Something was going on, right? 
and I'm going to have an upcoming podcast where we're going to delve in to that question. What happened? Was it paranormal? Was it Bigfoot? Was it a serial killer? What happened? The likelihood of it being a serial killer is pretty slim. All the victims were of different ages. There's nothing in common with them. There are men, women, older men, 18 year old women, an eight year old boy. That's not usually the case for a serial killer. The only thing they seem to have in common was all of these cases were in the last three months of the year. So, we'll be discussing this in the podcast I have coming up very soon. I hope you'll be interested in that. This is a very fascinating, interesting story to me. Sad. But there's so many mysteries. So many unanswered questions. Thank you for coming to my channel. If you are interested in these types of topics, I cover them quite often. If you would, please give this video a thumbs up if you have not already. If you would like to be subscribed, please do so. It's completely free. And if you would like to be notified of my content when it goes live, please go ahead and click that bell and notice on your screen somewhere we'll be given the option of how many times you'd like to be notified. Often, every time, or hardly ever. Please keep clicking until you get the option you'd like. And I would love to see you back here. Good night.